Yeah, um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, and welcome to my talk. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, welcome to my presentation on a deformable convolution filter which offers a promising new deep learning architecture. And this is joint work with Ozan Oktay from Imperial College and Nassim Buteya from Lübeck. And I'm Matthias. Uh, you may all know that <coughs> deep learning excels at learning both features and a classifier in an end-to-end -end fashion. Um, but we can also realize that the efforts have moved from feature engineering to so-called network engineering, as nicely put by Gilles uh, Resnex paper last year. And in addition, many of the current state-of-the-art um, segmentation networks in particular require many layers um, with residual or skip connections, preferable small kernels to deal with the large amount of trainable parameters, and um, some kind of multi-scale or dilation architecture to capture spatial context. Mm. So to deal with this increasing complexity of architectures, we propose a new concept that's quite different and uses a single sparse and spatially deformable filter and hopefully opens some new possibilities for CNN architectures that are easier to design, train, and deploy, but also can work with fewer labeled data and less GPU memory, but still achieves this, this nice uh, high accuracy of, of deep networks. I'd first like to stress that using spatial context is very important in medical data. Um, we can see this in two examples. If we look at the ECG morphology, it locally may look very normal, but the change of rhythm actually indicates some cardiac issue. And it's the same thing in, in CT images, where a small patch alone may not be um, sufficient to characterize this area as being part of some anatomy or pathology. So it really is important to, to use large spatial context. And researchers have turned to multi-layer architectures to deal with this. And often they um, use uh, residual connections or dilations. And they can tune these architectures. On the other hand, there's the very popular unit type architecture um, using an encoder and decoder, which first aggregates context by these downsampling layers and then tries to make up for the lost detail in the upsampling path. But we asked ourselves, how can we avoid these complicated design choices and numerous layers, and also maybe address some of the limitations which comes when we extend this whole thing to 3D medical data. And the first observation we made was that while these dense fully convolutional nets, FCNs, are very good at an inference prediction on 2D images, they become quickly limited by memory constraints when applied to 3D medical data. And this could lead to um, memory demands such as up to 10 gigabytes, which uh, could lead to just using a single image in a batch. And while Long showed in his paper empirically that um, yeah, using small batches doesn't, doesn't necessarily, isn't necessarily problematic if we train on 20,000s of, of 2D images, uh, having like, small medical data sets, there actually it can hurt uh, convergence. So um, we, we aim to have uh, more distinctive or more variability within batches and go away from these uh, dense, dense inference methods. Um, there's also the question of where to optimally place uh, these kind of skip connections or residual connections uh, somewhere in these networks, which um, sometimes leads to the question whether a deep learning scientist is more like a ne network engineer. So our goals are the following. We want to train a single convolutional layer that captures a large spatial context, and it should learn both the spatial offset and the coefficient in a continuous differentiable space of sparse kernels. And by going away from the fully convolutional architecture, we, we would hope to um, work with more varied batches, less memory, and, and be, be um, good on, on 3D data. So. To, to start with, I'd first like to review some of the interesting related work in this area on, on sparse networks or deformable convolutions. There was a C paper last year which introduced local binary convolutions as basically uh, very sparse kernels um, 
that replace all the normal convolutional kernels. There's, of course, the spatial transformer network, which was the first to introduce differentiable image sampling in, in neural nets. But they applied uh, only like an affine transformation to the whole feature map. And again, last year, there was deformable the convolutions, which uh, use additional classical CNNs to predict a feature map deformation, which uh, is then also class dependent. It helps the classification task. In our own previous work at last year's MICAI, we uh, tried a different concept where our idea was to first use a random layout of sparsely sampled filter elements and also restricted them to be plus or minus one weighted. Um, we then follow a uh, one by one convolution, so we separate spatial and channel convolution, uh, similar as done in the mobile nets. Um, and by this, we can drastically remove, uh, reduce the number of parameters, but still achieve a uh, fairly decent segmentation score on um, pancreas. Mm. So while there are advantages, because we have fewer trainable weights and, and fairly fast computation, even on CPU, um, there's still a limitation that these filter offsets are fixed and uh, they are not learned within the network. So to deal with this, um, we, we want to um, propose this new work, which is a concept for a trainable sparse filter layout. But to explain it in more detail, I'd first like to revisit the classical filter concept of convolutions, which have a spatially fixed layout of a grid-based coefficients. So normally, we have 3 by 3 kernels or 5 by 5 kernels, and all their spatial offsets are based on the grid. And we only learn the coefficient weights. Um, there's some variability. We can change the, the size of these kernels. We can change the gaps between them, so the dilation. Um, but more or less, everything is static here. And this is, I think, one reason why we have to go to these more complex multi-layer architectures um, to, to get more um, variability. But our, our concept is, is quite different. So we want to not only learn the filter coefficients, but also their, their spatial offsets. And to do this, we start by randomly initializing them. Um, and now we can see that these uh, spatial offsets may not necessarily lie on the image grid anymore. So to calculate the output, we actually need to perform a bilinear interpolation, which considers the four nearest grid points in 2D of 8 and 3D. And because these, um, these interpolation coefficients now depend on the spatial offsets of these filters, of these filter offsets. Um, we can treat them as just normal optimizable parameters or variables in our network. So we receive a, a gradient for backpropagation, and we can train the whole thing together end to end. And by this, we can drastically reduce the number of parameters, but also enable a more adaptive or automatically learned design of our architecture. And by this, I also think that it's easier to adapt this network to, to new um, domains. To give some further details, we follow our one um, extremely large and inflecting sparse kernel with just two layers of um, a multi-layer perceptron. So it's uh, spatially shared filter weights, a one by one convolution. Um, and of course, learn the spatial filter offsets during training, as I explained. And here we can see that even if we start from a very narrow filter kernel, it will expand during uh, the training as the network picks up that it requires more spatial context to classify the images. We further reduce the parameters by using channel group convolutions uh, in the first filter, um, and thereby only use about 150,000 weights um, 10 times less than the standard unit here. We additionally um, gained some improvements by pairing two of these spatial offsets to just one filter coefficient. Uh, and this idea is kind of, kind of taken from the, the brief sampling layout of Kalonda et al., um, where we can see that compared to, to this unary sampling, the binary sample, sampling actually performs quite nicely. Uh, the implementation is, is available open source on, on my GitHub. Um, in PyTorch, and we can see it's actually quite simple. It all 
happens here in this, uh, or the magic all happens here in this step where we use the grid sample function, which is the differentiable image sampling. And um, by using this, we can also implement a very simple uh, online affine augmentation, which is simply a, a matrix multiplication with our, with our fit, uh, offset layout. Um, and as I mentioned before, we, we can move away from using a dense FCN architecture because it's, it's actually quite efficient uh, using on a randomly sampled pixel grid. And so we are no longer restricted to uh, using dense inference. And this, of course, reduces the memory demand, but also enables us to use uh, an easy hard example mining, um, which helps convergence. We performed some experiments on just a small data set of 10 um, 3D CT scans of the visceral in a leaf one out fashion and used seven anatomical labels. Um, and we achieved a 5.5% improvement over a vanilla 3D unit, um, which already shows the robustness of this new approach to work with few labeled data. Um, we could reduce the number of parameters, as mentioned before, by about tenfold. And um, by, by using this sparse pixel sampling, um, we reduce the memory demand also quite uh, substantially. Um, we can also see that by um, using an adaptive sampling strategy during training, the convergence rate actually is, is quite fast compared to the unit. Um, and we additionally gain another, f or we gain a four and a half point improvement by using this pairing of two spatial offsets. Mm. An important question, of course, is whether learning of the offset helps. Uh, and this is uh, shown empirically. It, it improves about 5% in dice compared to this fixed layout, one times fixed layout of the brief net. Um, and when putting this all together with hard example mining and some affine augmentation, we reach a dice of 80.6%, which is fairly good. Um, interestingly, replacing the simple two-layer multi-layer perceptron as a classifier with a deeper uh, dense net doesn't need, lead to, to huge differences, just 1% gain. Um, and in the paper, we also show some proof of concept extension to uh, nonlinear registration um, using this and adaptive localization uh, of the junior grants. So um, to conclude, we presented a quite radically new concept for dense convolutional networks, which we hope uh, will enable people to rethink the architectural design taken so far. Um, it can reduce the computational demand and memory demand by replacing many of these um, memory-hungry dense layers with simple sparse kernels. And importantly, it reduces the sensitivity to design choices as um, this trainable sparse filter layout can adapt to the size of the image, um, the anisotropy of the data, et cetera. Um, some of the interpretability of the features may also be improved because we no longer need uh, skip connections, which makes it an easy drop-in for, for image registration or, or other tasks. And um, another important point is that we think that um, by going away from the fully convolutional architecture, we can re reduce the amount of required labeled data, which in the medical field is, is quite, quite of big importance. Um, there are, of course, some limitations. We, we haven't um, considered using uh, two-stage approaches or first predicting a bounding box and then, uh, th then um, segmenting just the, the, the bounding box. Uh, we haven't used weighted loss functions such as the dice. Um, and we still have to do some more larger scale evaluation on, on public data sets. Um, but the maybe most, most important uh, remaining question is how can we increase depth? Because in, in these examples, um, the, the um, shape of the, the anatomy is may, maybe fairly simple, but um, learning a feature hierarchy could, could be done in two ways, either by um, using multiple layers of the obelisk or exploring other uh, classifiers like a binary tree architecture, densely connected networks, or neural decision forests. So with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention uh, and video for support with the GPU um, and the, the middle organizers. And as a final uh, take home message, uh, I'd like to say if you, if you have tons of labeled data and a large amount of GPU memory available to you, 
then using a, a 3D unit variant will probably be best. But if, if, if you have neither of them, um, have a go at Obelisk. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for this interesting talk. Are there questions? Hi. Thanks for the nice talk. Um, I, I noticed that so if you have the filter elements tight together and arranged on a grid, then it's basically implementing like a classical convolution. So could you basically exploit that by essentially pre-training using sort of a classical architecture, mapping that, and then allowing it to have freedom after sort of it's initialized as sort of a classical convolution? Ah, okay. Like, do you do, you do that and, or? In, in our experiments, we, we, we trained everything in one go. Okay. What you're suggesting is to take, uh, to, to train the spatial arrangement separately from the filter coefficients or initialize using filter, co that's actually a quite good idea, yeah. Um, Okay. You I was also thinking you could sort of um, have some kind of cost that prevents it from uh, deviating too far from sort of the classical arrangement and maybe regularize it uh, in that way too. I think that's definitely a design choice you could later make, how to best leave it as compact as possible or something, leave it as close to, to standard uh, design, yeah, to standard layout as, as possible. It's, it's probably so sometimes good to, to constrain it from um, going too far, or maybe also to, to adapting too much to the data. But of course, augmentation will certainly help in these cases. But yep. yeah, cool. good, good points. So there was another question over there. Hey, uh, thanks for the, the great talk. Um, so I have uh, one question about uh, the convergence of these offsets. So you have a lot of offset pixels, and how do you uh, guarantee that they do not converge to the same offset location? I can imagine that such a certain location is very describing your features. Then these offsets tend to uh, move towards those points, so then you have overlapping uh, yeah, offsets. In, in general, it's not a problem if some of the uh, offsets overlap. That's the case in standard convolution kernels anyway, because we would have several channels, and all of them would share the same offset layout. So having some, some uh, similarity between, between, between different like, um, filter layers of this is, is fine. Um, but uh, maybe to, to answer this question slightly differently, using this pairing of two offsets, which I briefly explained, uh, kind of helps stabilizing um, the, the distinctiveness of, of the filter elements in, in our first experiments. Okay, yeah, I have one short second question yeah. is about a relation to um, compressed sensing and dictionary learning where typically L1 norms are put on the weights to sparsify your data. Suppose you have your weights of your kernels which are densely sampled, mm -hmm. then you optimize with an L1 loss on the weights, then some of the weights will decay to zero, some will survive. And then you have also offset, uh, right. uh, yeah, like this sparse kernels. This is it. quite interesting alternative strategy to, to achieving the same thing, right? You, you're just approaching yeah. it from a different angle. You, right, you, yeah. you start with dense and you go to sparse by, right. by having this L0 or L1 norm. Um, in practice, I think uh, this, this direction is, is easier because we, we start with the sparse layout and, and just have to adapt the position. But um, in, in some cases, it might be beneficial. Uh, for example, it might, s like it's kind of like an iterative uh, like, uh, optimization to find the, the best spatial layout. And there will be local minima there as well, so um, yeah. wi which might limit it in some way. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Your approach is more, way more memory friendly than starting off dense and then go to light. Mm. Yeah, I, I like the work. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Another quick question. Maybe I have uh, also, oh, yeah, no, Max. Okay. So um, do, do, can you also optimize it with the number of non-zero elements in that kernel? Uh, I don't, know. Um, this, this could be done by, by using the sparsity constraint just mentioned. Um, it's difficult uh, to just kind of, just, just use the cardinality as, as, as a goal, because that's probably not differentiable. But, um, so we, yeah, we, we have to do this as a, as a fixed input parameter, like this is a tuning parameter. Okay, yeah, thank you very much for the speaker, and we are going to the next. <laughs>